Hi, my name is Paula Sicarelli. I'm here with John Bergman. Thank you, John, for being here. With it's us. great to be here. And in this Educa Talks, we're going to talk about flipped classroom. John, how does it work? Well, flipped classroom is a simple idea. It's it's a educational framework that enables educators to reach every student. That's the critical piece. Reach every student. But the flipped approach essentially inverts the traditional model by introducing the course content before class, and then the class time is transformed into a place of active learning where students might be doing project-based learning. They might be doing inquiry or experiments or case bases or simulations or role playing, or maybe something as simple as just practicing problems. There's so many things you can do. The key thing is to make the classroom space active. Flipped learning is all about the class time, or something we call the group space time. That's what makes it magical. Some people think flipped learning is this thing about the videos. No, 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 no. It's about what happens in the classroom. That's the key. How should I do flipped learning? Like, do I need uh, special rooms? Do I need special teachers? Do I need special students? It's a simple process. You don't need anything special at all. You just need the right mindset. It's all about how you think about education. The idea is to not do whole group lecture anymore, but to record that using some type of recording device. Or sometimes, remember I said at the beginning, it's where you introduce course content before class. That can be in the form of text. It doesn't have to be in the form of a video. So you introduce that stuff, the lower content, if you will, the introductory stuff. If you think from Bloom's taxonomy, it's the lower levels of Bloom. You introduce that stuff, and then in class, that's where you do the more active learning things. It depends on the lesson. Some lessons you should do projects. Some lessons you should do an experiment. Sometimes a discussion. Sometimes it depends on the lesson. Great. So, what are like the most common mistakes that you see in the classroom? Well, some I'll just list off a few of them. I've seen people make. Flip, if they're doing flip, flip videos, that's very common is to do video. That's probably eighty percent of flip learning happens with video. They make their videos too long, so it's short, one topic, really to the point. It's really critical. In fact, I, I usually give a number: is take the age of your student, and that's the maximum number of minutes that your video should be, and never go over fifteen. So even if you're teaching thirty-year-old adults, never over fifteen. So short is the key. In fact, really like seven or eight minutes is probably more ideal for most students. Maybe younger students even shorter. So that's I see that's a mistake. Another mistake I see is people. I mean, the biggest question people ask about flipped learning is, what if the students don't do the work, and then they come to class and what do I do? And you know, that's kind of an interesting answer. Is that it's turned out that that's not been as big a problem as people think. Uh, you've got to hold students accountable. You've got to know if they did the work or not. So you've got to check to see if they did. And there's now tools that monitor, say, how long they read text or if they watched a video. So they can monitor that. But you can also, one good best practice is that you make your own content instead of using stuff on YouTube or whatever because they connect more with teachers, right? They connect more with about relationships and connections. Uh, or maybe the big one is if you, for example, let's say the very first time you do this, you experiment and, and you're going to fall when you first do this. What I see teachers do is they discover that maybe half their students didn't watch the video or read the text. And so then they go and they lecture because they, I've got to teach the stuff. And so what they've just told every student who watched it that they didn't need to, and those who didn't need to, who didn't, they don't have to. And so that's a huge mistake. You, you've got to hold your guns, stick with it, and as you do, it'll it'll change the game. And it's it's changing lives. Flip learning is amazing. It's 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 the best educational innovation in the last 20 years. And I, I just said that, but that's actually not a quote from me. It's a quote from one of the leading researchers in the world on active learning, Robert Talbert. He said, flip learning is the single most significant educational innovation in the last 20 years. So, I believe that. So you want to talk about, you want to change your class. You got to do it. Yeah. Here, like in Brazil, we don't have like a very good internet. So what teachers could do with like can be done. So, you know, we started this in 2007 in a rural school in the mountains of Colorado. And 30% of our kids didn't have the internet. So we had to solve this problem at the beginning of this whole thing. So we we discovered that our students at least had one piece of technology at home. They had a DVD player. So we took our videos and we burned them onto a DVD. So they went home and they put it into their DVD player and they watched the videos. So that our students wouldn't have access 
since then, there's lots of other ways. If a student has a mobile phone of some kind, you can get the videos not online, but offline to them through like a micro SD cards. There's also now cheaper MP4 players. They, they already have. You can again download them and no internet required. There's ways to make it happen. You have to get creative, but it can be done. Can you tell us about one uh, case that you think that is the best case or the best example of the classroom? I'll give you one example, and not just the best, but it's a very good one. It's, it's at Harvard Medical School. I was visiting uh, Dr. Richard Schwartzstein's class. He invited me to come there. By the way, Harvard Medical School, the entire school is flipped. It says something at Harvard Medical School, it's flipping, that says something. But the students had done some pre work. It was a hematology class, that's bloods. And as they'd walked in, they'd done the pre work, and they're in tables of four. And Dr. Schwartzstein essentially said, All right, he, I actually back up. He throws up on this PowerPoint, he shows up a screen, and says, The patient came to you, he has, he's complaining about this, you did these tests. So he just gave him a case. It's called it's a case based, as we call it. So he gives him a case, and then the doctors, the, the medical students, then got a piece of paper out and worked silently for three or four minutes. A piece of paper, and they're writing down what they think the patient has. And then he, I forget how he said it, but it's like phase two happens, and the room gets really loud, and the students are now having conversations in their tables of four, and you're arguing that he has, he has um, one type of blood disease, and I'm saying, no, he has leukemia, and then the other person, and then we're having a debate at our table about what we think strong information is. And then it gravitates for five or seven or eight minutes, something like that, and then all of a sudden we have a whole group discussion. There's 60 maybe students in the room, and we're having a debate about what do we think is the wrong with the patient, and then what do we need to do? And they come to a conclusion as a whole class, and then I think something really powerful, Dr. Schwartzstein pulls up a chair next to one young doctor, and he says, okay, I'm going to play the patient, and you get to play the doctor. As it turns out, he had a bad form of leukemia, and it was, the prognosis was bad. And you have to tell me if I have, that I have leukemia and what the options are. And this is now the human piece, right? Because it's one thing to say somebody has leukemia, somebody tells someone they have leukemia. So case-based uh, uh, peer instruction is kind of what he calls it. Then he threw in a little bit of uh, role-playing at the end. This is the kind of thing that anyone can do because yeah. it's like you don't need special furniture or nothing like that. A bunch of tables and kids talk and all they did I, I talked with the students you know I got I was free to just move around and talk with some of the students and they'd done some pre-work this little video on different types of leukemia or something like that and there were some readings that they had to do that was their pre-work and they came to class like nothing that was interesting about that setting I don't know if you, this is true here in Brazil but in the U.S., it's usually not required for students to attend group class in institutions of higher education, medical schools, for example. So I went up to one young man and I said, why are you here? I mean, you don't have to be here. Why did you come? And he, he turned and he said, I'd be the biggest idiot in the world if I didn't come. This is the best thing I do to be here, prepare myself to be a doctor. So he didn't have to be there, but he chose to be there. In fact, the room was full. You know, I, I compare this, I was recently on a trip to one of the largest universities in the world, I won't mention it. And I got a chance to tour their lecture halls. And they were completely, almost empty. I walk into run, one room, and there were supposed to be 200 and some odd students in there, and there were seven. Seven. But the teacher, what's she doing? Lecture. Because you see, they stream and record it, and the kids say, oh, why, would I, why would I go to class if it's just recorded? And then actually turns out, I said, I turned to my, my host, I said, what percentage of them actually watch it? Because of course you can monitor that if they're recording it. He said 20%. So only 20% are even paying attention to the lectures anymore. So why do we keep doing it? It's stupid. Higher education is broken. It needs to change. So what learning is the answer? Yes. I believe that too. Thank you very much, John, for being here, for accepting our invitation to come here to Brazil to yes. participate at the CIA from Abed and thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much.